Thank you very much. Right. Everyone can hear me okay, yeah, the mic's working. Fine, excellent. So, share of search. Um, I'll apologize first of all. Uh, the, 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 the slides aren't the wizziest. I, they aren't the most beautiful. They are practical and functional and pragmatic. Um, and what we're going to go through today is a bit about share of search, a bit about its history, what it actually is, but also how you can use it, the practical applications of share of search and what you can uncover and discover both about your own brand, but also your own brand within the context of the market, how the other players are acting, um, how they're using uh, advertising as a growth lever or not, how they're using other channels as a growth lever, potentially. Um, advertising isn't the only thing that drives growth. Um, and without further ado, I suppose, this is me. Hi, I'm James Hankins. I am the founder of Visor Consulting, uh, which is my consultancy, and I'm also a Global Vice President of Marketing Strategy and Planning at Sage. Sage are a SaaS business. Um, in the uh, kind of accounting and finance space. Um, we provide uh, financial accounting solutions to small and medium businesses. Um, this should be quite fun, um, and questions are really important. The whole point of these techniques that I'm going to run you through are that they provoke questions and hypotheses, which you can then delve into and investigate. That's the starting point. As a planner, that is absolutely what I've used Share of Search to do over the last kind of six, seven, eight years nearly. Um, whereas Les has focused primarily on proving that Share of Search equals Share of Market and that relationship, um, I took on kind of, uh, when I discovered it, I wanted to turn it into a practical set of, or suite of tools, and I've developed a number of which we'll go through uh, a load today. So this is the big question. What if I told you there was an easy way to have an informed, and I say easy in quotation marks, uh, to have an informed view on a brand's relative performance over time, how a brand or business derives its growth over time relative to its competitors, the categories rate of growth and the behavior of brands relative. Are those brands growing in line with the, the category or are they slowing down or are they kind of growing faster? An understanding of the business or brand positioning and understand investment in media and channel impact and also creative execution as well. It's kind of a lot of what we do within marketing, especially within advertising. Um, and share of search can help do all of those things, because um, I'm sure you would be interested, because I certainly was. And it all comes from the world's greatest or largest database of intent, the Google uh, search uh, bar. Now, what's quite interesting is that when this analysis, share of search equals market share, has been looked at, uh, on other platforms, LinkedIn being one, um, the relationship holds true. Basically, in general, people search in proportion to how they buy. That's, that's at the heart of share of search. People search in proportion. It sounds so obvious when you say about this. But it is a little bit underrated because people can't believe that it could be so simple. Um, and Zlatan, obviously, because I'm in Sweden, um, is still slightly underrated at a global level because he's been around at the same time as Ronaldo and Messi. If Ronaldo and Messi weren't around, he'd be the greatest player in modern times. His scoring record is phenomenal. Um, but he is underrated relative to those two. So share research still has a bit of that because people don't believe. Now, I may be about to blow some minds. There is a lot. This is my favorite gift by far. Um, there is a lot of information and data within this. It's all case study based. So it's me demonstrating through case studies what you can tell using Share of Search in its guises. So we'll dive in. Um, let's start. That's the key observation, not an insight. Um, strategist getting picky. Share of Search equals Share of Market. And why is that? 
the insight is because people broadly search in proportion to the way they shop by and because branded search actions are a good proxy for spending with a brand. That's the insight that sits behind it. It's really, really simple, seems really obvious and self-evident, and yet it isn't because it's taken us a long time to come to it. Um, now, myself and Les uh, Binet kind of published in the same week. We were working on it unbeknownst to each other for a number of years. Uh, and then, surprise, surprise, and it was a surprise, we both published. I published on a Tuesday, and he published on a Thursday. Uh, and we've worked together ever since. We lead the IPA uh, share of search think tank, um, and we're doing some more work this year. Um, F Week um, 2021 headliners, um, and uh, the, the guys over at My Telescope are part of that uh, think tank as well. And we've got more to come in 2022. So more insights, more work in share of search, and more case studies with clients using this actively. The thing is, when you say share of search, used to be the case, more so, people immediately jump to PPC or SEO. And it's absolutely not that share of search. That's share of search as an input. You're spending on uh, PPC and your share um, of searches uh, within a specific keyword set. This is share of search as an output, a result of activity. Um, but first, a diversion. Why is it important? Why is share of search equals share of market important? Um, we're all planners, we're all marketers, um, but it's worth reminding ourselves of the holy trinity of profit, revenue, market share. Um, the holy trinity of business performance. Uh, there's an argument that revenue is a, a vanity metric and that profit is the be all, but actually, um, I believe the other one is, is trumps them all because you have internal metrics, profit and revenue, and then you have an external metric, which is market share. And the way I like to present it and the way that I believe frames it uh, appropriately and why share of search is so important is because results are relative to oneself. So profit is great if it grows, revenue is great if it grows, but it's relative to oneself. Market share, share of search is about performance. It's relative to the market and the competition. And what is business if it's not about improving performance relative to, one, relative to the competition? It's about being successful and winning. Winning. And that is why share of search is important, because it gives you a metric around winning and performance. Anyone can set targets and hit them. Winning against the competition is slightly more difficult because they are dynamic and you are dynamic. There's some research, uh, there will be a copy of this, but there's some research on why market share is important um, from academia to whet your appetite. Um, but winning, winning's really important. So what do you do with share of search in this metric for winning and how do you get it? That's where you start. Everyone's got access for, to it around the world. Some places like Russia have a different uh, search engine, but that's fine because Share of Search works there too. Um, and there are other providers such as My Telescope and EDO globally who automate uh, the capability um, that you can get out of this simple tool. Because there are restrictions to using this simple tool. For example, it can only take five brands at, at any one point. Getting the right term is really, really important. And this is actually where kind of search planners are really, really useful because they're super bright and understanding what people put into the search engine. So there's a great example here, and I don't know if you've got it in Sweden, but fruit and fiber, Kellogg's fruit and fiber. The brand term is fruit and fiber, yeah, in blue, because consumers don't actually type in fruit and fiber, they type in fruit and fiber. And if you do the validation analysis against the market share, you'll find that fruit and fiber is the term that is more closely correlated with market share, not fruit and fiber, because no one uses that. 
So it's important to understand the term that consumers are using relative to your product. And then there's a very, very simple equation. Now, I'm not going to go too much into detail about how you do it because, uh, quite frankly, there's loads out there. There's my blog, which gives you a step-by-step -step guide. IPAF Week has got a video and a deck on it as well. If you've got access to WARC, there's two papers on WARC from me that go into greater detail as well. And today's not a training session. Um, it's a session in possibilities around what share of search can actually do. Now, back to these, remember these. How can you do it? Well, there's 11 practical applications, 11 that I've developed over the last six to eight years. And I've split them into, uh, there's share of search on its own, and there's share of search plus inputs. And then in the middle, is the validation, because I still believe that validation is important. It's all very well me standing up here and saying SOS equals SOM, believe me, or you can go off and do it yourself. You can engage with my telescope, you can engage with EDO, et cetera, et cetera, who can help you do it for, for you. Validation, quite important. The first step. So, as I said, I'm not gonna pretend it's a law. Does anyone recognize the owl? It's the Ehrenberg Bass Institute's owl. It's Byron Sharp's distinctive asset and his laws of marketing that are well known. Um, I'm not gonna pretend it's a law. And also if I did, then Byron would be tweeting me or sending me messages um, on LinkedIn um, being quite aggressive. Um, but I've never seen it not hold true. But there will be one time where it doesn't. So I'm not going to stand up there and embarrass myself. Validation also leads to greater understanding because what you're after is market share data, which is really, really expensive. And you can get hold of it, and that's fine if you can afford it. Um, there is a time delay and the, and the cost. But what you're after is market share data, or at the very, or at the very least, data that represents market share. So you begin hunting. And that's where you go all Sherlock, mostly. Um, because if you're looking for representative data for market share, it's likely to be fragmented and there's likely to be limited amount of it. Share of search data is a longitudinal strand of data that goes back 18 years. It's a wealth of information, 18 years worth of performance, relative performance. So you might be able to validate it with a couple of kind of independent points and then you can take it as such. But you'll need to go all Sherlock on it. And I do actually own, just realized, I own that coat. And it's in that room back there, because it's a really nice coat. Um, validation is really, really important as well if you're having a conversation with the CFO. There's absolutely, I mean, you can see it, it happening, kind of marketeer rocking up with our share of search. We've already said that it's underrated showing the, the CEO, oh, well, our share of search is down. He's like, well, yeah, that's not money, is it? What does that mean? And validation, therefore, is really, really important for bringing senior stakeholders along. And in digging deeper, deeper, you'll learn something more about the category. You'll probably have to trawl through all your competitors' market reports. Um, you'll get government reports. There's a lot of free stuff out there that you can get hold of. Um, I am confident you'll be OK really. Um, the IPA, under the auspices of myself and Les, um, have done over 30 case studies across 12 categories, seven countries, three different languages, and we're getting information consistently come through of other people who have validated this multiple, multiple times. Um, much of the analysis has looked at vol uh, value share, sorry, share of revenue. However, there are a few cases where volume share has also been used. And there's a list of all the ones that we've looked at. Um, there is some multiple ones there, breakfast cereal in different countries, for example. And the correlation coefficient is 83%, which means you're pretty high correlation between the two. They move together. It does vary. And this is the worry. I mean, when I see 60-40, I do wince a little because you've got to be careful of the statisticians like and the statistician's lake is the joke that says that a statistician drowned in a lake two centimeters deep on average. There's a lot of variation in that lake. 
there's a lot of variation in category. So just taking that line isn't appropriate. You kind of have to do your own heavy lifting here. Um, but there is that consistent. And you can already work out some insight from this. Where that line crosses on that axis will tell you something about the category you're in. So if it crosses the share of market axis, what it's saying is that your category can de de derive sales growth without deriving share of search. That is, it can derive sales growth by using supply only. Says law, supply creates its own demand. You're available. Physical availability is a good driver of market share in a category where that line crosses the share of market. If the, the, the line crosses the share of search axis, that means that consumer demand has to be present because people are searching for it in order to drive share of markets on average. So you can already begin to derive some insights around the nature of your category just by doing that simple piece of analysis. And where I talk about kind of supply side and demand side, this is a lovely diagram that, that Les and I have put together that tries to explain what share of search represents. And we believe that share of search represents mental availability. And actually, we've proven that share of search correlates ridiculously highly with mental availability. And that's why Byron Sharp has suddenly gone all quiet on us, because he didn't like it to begin with. And now we've proven that it matches one of his greatest adventures. Now, the other side is supply side, which includes price and physical and digital availability. And we are looking into the potential relationship. At the moment, you've got price up there. We're looking into the potential relationship between share of search and relative price. And that's on the, scape, uh, the, the scope for this year's F week. So you've got share of search, which is demand side primarily, which is why it doesn't perfectly correlate with market share. It's the majority of market share. Warning. Warning sign. Few words of advice with share of search. Share of search is an output of everything a business does and also everything that can happen to a business. Negative PR can have an effect on share of search, so you have to bear that in mind. It's not a perfect metric. We talked already about value market share, relative position. It's a whole business metric. It's not just advertising or marketing that will affect it. You can game it if you hire a click farm to buy you brand search clicks. So it requires true fraud. And we have heard that has happened. Um, and it does not preclude the possibility, obviously, of a brand growing in absolute terms. So back to those profit and revenue and market share, where well, you can grow in profit, but you can stay still in market share. You can grow in revenue, but you can still stay, still stay still in market share because you've grown with the market and everyone's maintained their position. So it's, it's, it's using share of search amongst other things. It's not a perfect measure. I'm not going to pretend it is. Um, so you've kind of got this validation. You've gone through this validation. You've learned a bit more about the category. Um, where do you go for it? You can go for clients direct. Investor relations is usually a really good place. Companies House in the UK provides, um, and there's, a, there's, there's numbers of other organizations globally that do this, provides every business's financial accounts, and you can f find gems in there. There's third party research, official data sources, just go on the hunt. And here's some examples of share of search. So this is using SMMT data in the UK. That's the official data source for motor sales. Kantar uh, publish UK supermarket share. So it's just validated against that. UK broadband market, they bought in data. Potato snacks, Kantar again. Client data for premium makeup. Uh, company reports for large retailers and department stores. Company reports again for discount stores. Uh, comparison websites, company reports again. So just trawling for representative data. US distance learning market, which is their official PED database, uh, remarkably accurate. The US mattress market, company reports. Um, click US appliances market, company reports. So company reports are quite a treasure trove. Um, I'm sure you agree. Um, another way of looking at it, so we've done the cross tab. What do you see here? There's three brands, branded house, house of brands, branded house. A strategic choice to be made. 
Um, this is actually in cereals. You can see that when there's a branded house, there is a remarkable correlation between aggregate share of search and total value share. Within House of Brands, obviously that's fragmented because if you've got multiple brand names under a uh, kind of uh, a, a master brand, it's not gonna come through share of search like it does with these two other ones, which are Weetabix and Kellogg's. Brand level analysis also helps too. This is over time and what you're looking for is to make sure those lines are moving roughly in the same direction at the same time. Um, these are comparison websites, Money Supermarket, GoCo, Compare the Market and Confused. Two different brands with two different patterns. It's a remarkable uh, correlation there in terms of that trajectory. And there's something interesting happening over on the far side um, between share of undergraduates and share of search, which is the kind of comparison that we've got there. Share of undergraduates is falling a lot quicker than share of search, which suggests that they were attracting interest as a result of share of search, but they weren't converting it to share of undergraduates. So they had a conversion issue. Why were they losing people who were interested and then not following through? Who were they losing them to? Who were they losing share to? It's a leaping off point. The share of search is a really useful way of doing that. I usually talk about T now, but I'm not going to. There's a really nice case study about T where I discovered that when uh, prices of tea go up, all consumers go and buy private label, even if it's not the cheapest, um, even if branded uh, tea is the cheapest. And I found that out by doing some analysis in volume and value to correlate against market share. So you can find out lots of different things. Because what that tells us about tea is don't discount at all, ever, if you're a brand, because you ain't gonna be chosen if you're the cheapest anyway. It's gonna be private label. Back to these, share of search over time, the very simple kind of uh, representation. And there's a lot going on here. This is the pre premium makeup category. There's a brand here called Mac who used to absolutely dominate the market. They had uh, kind of um, uh, stores on every high street, very high quality makeup, um, and they've been in decline since kind of 2015 and there has been a cultural shift there's been the falling of barriers to entry the rise of the DTC uh, makeup brand well, what's really interesting about down here is when you delved into this it appears that everyone's aggregating around the same area the reason why everyone's aggregating around the same area is because everyone's using exactly the same media channels to talk to anyone they're only using social so they're talking they've got a limit of reach and the only brand that's breaking out is this brand here Charlotte Tilbury the only brand that are breaking out. And they're breaking out because they went on TV. And that's a couple of steps on from this piece of analysis. But there's a hell of a lot of narrative going on just in that chart there. Mac are on death's door, basically. They've been almost wiped out market share-wise from 35% to, I believe, this has carried on, and so they are under 15% now in the space of five, six years. Not a great place to be if you're them. This tells us the narrative of the accounting software market, very close to my heart. Uh, three different brands there. And what you've actually got is two stages of the market. You've got the dominant player, which is Sage, is the company I used to work, I work for, sorry, not used to work for. Um, and you've got the rising player in blue. And the blue player embraced cloud before Sage did. Sage were all about licenses and on-prem. And that's the difference. That's what's happened there. The market has shifted to a B2C market where people are buying direct. And this brand here are dominating in that sphere. Um, Sage are playing catch up essentially. And the other brand is a large American brand called QuickBooks. This market is a comparison website market. I used to work in it back in 2008. I launched Geo Compario in the UK. He's a Welsh opera singer. There was a lot of competition around that period. These guys are spending upwards of 100 million pounds each. They launched uh, a wonderful kind of brand character compared to Meerkat. At that time, look how small they were relative to everyone else. They've owned that. They've managed to get to number one and there's been barely any change since 2011. You see this with a lot of digital markets. The first mover or the one that gets first quickest is able to dominate that market. In the UK, you've got right move. Uh, versus uh, Zoopla, 
Um, Zuplo are one-tenth the size despite spending tens of millions and being bought up by a VC. That stability and that lack of kind of movement really has great implications for business strategy. Um, and I've got a case later on where I'll show you how that feeds through. So you've got those narratives, growth in share of search, uh, share of search over time. What you've also got is growth in share of search. So the change from year to year or period to period, how quickly are different brands moving? So again, this is back to those uh, Sage and its two competitors. And what it suggests is that there is movement within category and you can actually see here that Sage is on a positive journey. Um, it doesn't quite correlate with my joining the business. It's a bit earlier than that. Um, but you can begin to see where share is coming from when you start charting it like this. All this is, is the annual difference between, say, share of search one year and the previous year. So you run share of search and then you do a very, very simple calculation over time, one minus the previous year, and you get this annual delta in share of search. So again, very, very simple Excel manipulation that allows you to paint a picture of how a brand is deriving growth. Another brand here, a big grower in the white goods market. This is a wonderful brand called Shark. Shark, yes, Shark, who do hoovers. And they've been doing astoundingly well in the US and globally as well. Um, they are on course uh, to take a big bite out of Dyson's leadership. Uh, they recently wrote a billion for the first time. Um, lockdown was very, very good for them. Show of search data. Um, so this is what's quite interesting is against validated iPads data in the distance learning market in the US, you obviously have an annual, annual position. You get that every year, but you don't know what happens in between. Share of search can fill that gap in. iPads data also comes out two years in arrears. Share of search doesn't. Share of search is updated every single day. So you suddenly have a nice long picture that you can bridge those official stats data and you can tell the maneuvers in between. S-curves and Rogers innovation. Again, simple cumulative formula of this share of search data, and you suddenly have an S-curve jumping out of the textbook. And what you've got here is a category with two S-curves, which means something happened around about here to accelerate growth, you know, your theory of S-curves and also innovation curves. Now, what happened there is in Sage's market, cloud arrived. So up until that point, it was fairly stable. Then cloud arrived and completely opened up the market and made these solutions a lot more affordable and accessible to a lot more people. What else can you do with this? Well, this is the comparison website market and it's flattening off in the UK. And if you get third party validation, it will tell you that 72% of people used a comparison website in any one year. Now that means growth is slowing. Almost everyone is using it. So where else? Do you get growth, revenue growth? Well, you start to look about, right, if it switches, that's very expensive. What about new product development, pr pricing, mergers and acquisitions? How are you going to derive from a non-core product growth? Is essentially what that's telling us, all from share of search. COVID had a direct impact on the UK private school market. Suddenly parents weren't interested in looking. They didn't want to send their kids away. They couldn't send their kids away because um, they were at home. So you had a, a plummeting of interest, but it's beginning to build back. So again, for those schools within this group, they should be aware of this tr trend and should be managing for it. You can also equalize competitor sets uh, or brands by week. So you can see relative to their starting point, because we've got this huge amount of data, how big brands are relative to another at the same point in their history. We talked about Sage earlier being this big beast. Well, Zero is well on its way to ca catching up at the same time of its evolution. And bearing in mind, at that time, Sage was the only player. Now Zero are coming in and eating their lunch. Comparing countries. Country B had legislation. Country A didn't. You can see the direct effect of that legislation on the acceleration in growth in that market, all from share of search. 
leading and lagging. This caused me loads and loads of problems. Les put it up and he said, share research is a leading indicator. The reason it caused me loads is, and he says it moves over time, the relationship. Um, now, the reason it caused me loads of problems, I'll flip through that, it's another one of my things, um, is because it performs a specific role. The only way you can find out if you've got leading or lagging is if you've got granular market share data anyway. And then the benefit is slightly different. Because if that data, say, comes from Nielsen, then there's a seven week lag. And you can get market share data seven weeks earlier than Nielsen provided. Can you make enough shifts in that seven weeks? I.e., can you see what's happening in market share terms quicker than your competitors and then get something out in market within seven weeks? It's an operational challenge, arguably, rather than any sort of strategic challenge. And that's what leading and lagging tells us. Um, versus category, again, very, very simple. If you get a gen generic term, get your PPC guys working on it, what is the generic term that represents your category? And does your brand's search indices correlate with it? Because if it does, it means you're growing with the category. If it doesn't, and it's negative, then you're probably kind of declining and you've got a massive problem. So it's a very, very easy, stark way of showing category growth versus brand growth. And most businesses should grow in line with the category. It's very, very difficult to disrupt a category, usually. Now this brand here, it's a large mattress provider in the US. From that period, the correlation with the category is almost perfect. However, lockdown hit, and suddenly that correlation was broken. Now where did that share go? Well, that share ended up going to the large, kind of bigger players, this is a DTC brand, large, bigger players who um, were kind of seen as more trustworthy and reliable. The Sealys of this world, huge, huge mattress business versus this punchy little um, kind of DTC player. But that's a problem if you're the FD of that company, suddenly realizing that your market, your brand isn't growing with the market. How do we get back to that stage then? Category intent, another example of using those generic terms and correlating your share of search with those generic terms to making sure, I mean, I'd hate to be these two businesses. They're growing in the opposite direction, i.e. shrinking than the category. You want to be highly correlated with it. Flip over from share of search on its own, share of search and inputs, the classic ratios. Um, Everyone's aware of share of voice versus share of market. Brands that invest above their market share tend to grow. Brands that tend to decline are under investment. We can use share of search to apply to this as well if you've got that data. Now, in, within this category, there isn't a, a kind of overarching relationship. This again is kind of uh, accountancy software, um, but the relationship holds true at brand level. Now, the reason why it doesn't work at a category level, and it's included within the theory of share of voice, share of market, is because it's a fairly new category in kind of relative terms. And so there is this speaking up. With this category, most players are on that line. They fit, and there are two players that aren't. That top one had recently got in trouble with the government, and so was shrinking. And that other brand um, was significantly over investing and was growing. But the rest all fit the pattern. They were all along the line. Again, this one, there's some movement up and down, but broadly speaking, it's the relationship is being pulled down by those brands down the bottom who are negative, um, who don't spend anything on advertising. They derive their growth from another way. The other classic is the Jones model. This is extra share of voice. So it's share of voice minus share of search in this case. Um, so it can be positive or negative versus share of market. Bigger brands can get away with spending re less relative to size. Biggest brand in the world, arguably, Amazon. Um, it's quite huge um, versus the slightly smaller brands over on the left hand side but it all, all correlates. They are the world's largest advertiser. They're still underspending relative to their market share. They certainly were in the UK. 
Again, another example, Argos, a huge multi-retailer versus the slightly smaller brands there. Motor in the UK, Ford, biggest motor company. Again, budget bearings tell us that share of search relative to extra share of voice, you can get away with spending less. Or another way of looking at it, you can chart it over time and you can see these two brands in the, the white goods market, kind of as they increase their extra share of voice, low their share of search moves in the same direction. And you can plot it out very, very simply like this. Another two examples. On the left hand side, a famous toaster maker, share of voice versus share of search and extra share of voice. When they invest, they get a benefit. When they don't, they see a decline. Out of the classic ratios into my favorite piece of analysis, the quadrants. What we're doing here is taking share of search and we're looking at the growth in share of search, so that delta. So you've got a positive negative versus last year. An extra share of voice, are you spending more relative to your market share or less? That gives you this wonderful plot that tells you if you spend more and you are deriving growth, then you are geared for growth in the top right hand corner. If you're in the opposite side, you're spending less than your market share, but you are still growing, you're generating efficient growth. Now, there is a question as to what is driving that. And then if you're below the line, like Sage were, you're essentially managing decline. Another pattern here, the dominant move does appear to be vertical, which means lots of brands are moving, they're growing year on year. Significant shifts in share of search relative to X share of voice, but some of them are moving across the axis as well. What are they doing to engender that growth? And again, once you plot it out like this, you can see how brands are deriving growth, or you can hypothesize if it's not from marketing, then it could be from sales, for example. They could have a strong sales team, and that's exactly what was happening in the previous one. The blue team over there have an amazing sales organization. That's how they grow. The green team spend a shit ton of money on advertising, and Sage weren't doing anything in particular. All there on that chart. Another example, there's some interesting movements in FMCG here, but primarily it's all bundled around that kind of some are growing, some are not, they're not really doing much advertising, so they're probably kind of just in-store promotions for an FMCG tea brand. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'll click through. Another example there, effective use of advertising above limited use or poor use. That's how you begin to just split the different positioning of the brands relative to their use in advertising using share of search. And at a brand level, what you can do is plot that out. It's the same data, all you're doing is plotting it out over time, and you can see a brand move around that quadrant. What were they doing in any one month? How were they utilizing? Or you can split it in this way, you can correlate the lines. So extra share of voice, investing more than your market share, deriving growth in this case. Another two examples, IKEA, brilliant example. They've pretty much been, ever since, so I, I worked on The Wonderful Every Day and as a, um, as a co author of The Wonderful Every Day in the UK, um, they have always been in the growth quadrant. But there was some weakness over here, and they realized, and so they increased their spend just in time. Famous DTC mattress brand, who everyone talks about, they share a name with a ghost and an awful business who lose tons of money and have no idea what they're really doing. Um, a vertical, vertical plunge in terms of their performance uh, during lockdown. Um, absolutely, I'd be definitely worried if I was working there. Here, another brand suddenly saw a drop off again during lockdown. What was it they did? Well, what they actually did was double their marketing spend, but took all of that spend and put it into social. And lo and behold, 100% into social, it had, their reach was limited, so it, their performance began to fall off. Flick through. For examples of that relationship, the link to that is investment with channel. You can see uh, media strategy changing and having a direct effect 
Do we think that the flight to digital helped this brand out? Probably not. Soon as they turned off all their press, started to go digital, their share of search plummeted, almost perfectly correlated. Again, you can begin to chart out the percentage of budget that you spent in each channel over time against your share of search, and you can plot this lovely line, and you can see where you make changes in media and whether it has an appropriate effect on your relative performance. Again, another example here. Simple way of doing it is also just to look at kind of uh, total spend versus the peaks in the raw data. When you spend, are you seeing an increase in relative search volumes? Yes, it's likely to feed through into your share of search. So you can see the immediate impact of your spend very, very quickly. Are you generating additional searches? Again, another way of doing it, again, total spend versus share of search. And you can see the long-term effect. I'd be worried. Look at all that spend they put into uh, October, November 2019, and they s still declined, this brand. Where were they investing that money and what creative were they putting it on? Again, another big Christmas, another failure. Something is not good at that business. The gap between share of search and share of market. So there's a lot in here, but the gap between, I've leaned on others here, and at this point, I kill everyone because I talk about extra share of search, which is another initialization, and it's rather too complicated. Uh, but essentially, if your brand is deriving more share of search than its market share, then it should grow. That's the hypothesis. And we've seen it happen a few times. And um, part of my uh, kind of uh, professional career working with a company called EDO, they have proven it time and time again. However, this is an example that suggests it might not be the case and that there's more going on. Sainsbury's and Asda have exactly the same market share, but different share of search. The hypothesis is Sainsbury's is, a, is not a value retailer. It's a mid-market. It's got fewer customers, but they pay a higher price. Asda is a value. So they've got a lot more customers coming in, but they're spending less. The volume is having an effect on the share of search here. That's why it's above and that's why it's below. It's not related to growth in that market. So just be careful with that. But there's plenty of research that shows from EDO that that is the case. What I would suggest is just be cautious. And then finally, we talk about the zigzag. And the zigzag's quite cool because it relates to that, that everyone's seen time and time and time again. You can create your own version. This is the share of search of share of search. So when me and Bennett published in the same week, and then we did F week, and then we're doing F week 21. Not quite sure what happened here, um, but you need to investigate. Um, but it's increasing. Um, what you can do is you can use the raw Google Trends index data as your short term. You can use your short share of search as your long term, because it's a 12 month rolled percentage figure. And then you can put your share of voice over the top. And you can see whether your share of voice is having a, an impact on the short term and the long term, all in one chart. And you make that zigzag. So for the first time ever, it's jumped off the page. It's now a practical way of turning that chart, that theory, into a chart that you can show your bosses, your colleagues. Is our advertising working? It's another example here. Very, very simple. Is it having a short-term effect? Yes, it is. Is it having a long-term competitive effect? Yes, it is. All of that we've just gone through. A brand's relative performance over time. How it derives growth. Is it from advertising? Is it from sales? Is it from pricing? Is it from other things on that quadrant? The category's rate of growth. And are your brands growing at the same rate? What is the position? And we talked about Asda versus Sainsbury's. We also talked about Zero versus QuickBooks and um, Sage. You can understand its position in market and its stance. You could understand directly investment in media channel um, and whether your advertising is being effective or not. And yes, that is a lot. 
but there is a lot that Share a Search can do. And you can paint wonderful pictures of the dynamics of your category with a very, very simple metric. And all of this was done in Excel, and I am not a quant, and I use basic Excel equations to do all of this. Sums, pluses and minuses, that's about it. So, with that in mind, take a breath, because I realize that I've battered you overhead with a lot of information. But that's it. I imagine there are loads and loads of questions, hopefully, um, because I don't know whether you believe me or not. But Share of Search is a fantastic tool, provides a fantastic opportunity to understand your category, and I think more people should use it. Thank you, James. So uh, I hope that was as mind-blowing for, for you as it was for me. Uh, and I hope you have tons of questions ready for James. Uh, as I said in the beginning, there's a possibility to ask questions on Menti via the link. And if there are any brave souls here, please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you and you can ask the questions to James directly. Uh, joining me for this Q&A session is one of the founders of the fantastic tool that we will soon present to you uh, in my telescope, Fredrik. Um, so, any brave souls that are that have any questions prepared? I'm sure Mats Rönne has a, has a question, so I'm uh, oh, going to. Yeah, I think you can. I thought your first case there with the Kellogg's uh, serial brand, I think, was an interesting one. Is, is understanding which search criteria to, to actually use as your as your baseline? Could you sort of explore a bit of how you go about finding that? Uh, yeah, for me personally, because I'm not a PPC master. It's trial and error. Um, so I often go looking for the validation data, and then I play around with terms and look for the one that fits most appropriately. Um, so uh, QuickBooks, who are one of Sage's big competitors, are owned by Intuit. And Intuit QuickBooks is a term that is in the public domain. But it's QuickBooks that people type in because it's the product. They don't type in Intuit QuickBooks. So it's, it's just about either getting a very smart PPC planner to help you out or trial and error um, to work out which one is most representative. Although I know that the guys at my telescope um, also do um, a lot of work with kind of represent representative data and the right term that correlates best. But they have some smart programmers um, who help them out with that. You want to add to that, Frederick? No, I mean, yeah. James definitely has a point when he says that it is, it is trial and error. Um, the only thing we do is that we provide you with a whole overview with a whole bunch of words. And then it's, it's a, still a little bit of the same where you can click on and click off, but you get it much faster than having to go through an entire Excel sheet and then say, ah, oh, this doesn't work, and then having to find something else. Any more questions? Do you all believe me? You're all going to rush off and start using Share of Search tomorrow and you're going to present your validations to your CFOs uh, the day after and you're going to operationalize it. I mean, we have operationalized it at uh, Sage. So it is one of our key metrics and we're a two billion uh, pound business. We're a FTSE rated business um, and it's being operationalized at that level, at kind of CFO level. So it is a very, very powerful tool. Um, within our organization. Now I have a question. Yeah, if you already have your brand tracker and ad tracker set up, do you suggest that we can skip that and use this instead, or how can we use this as a complement to what we do? Uh, so often what I find with brand trackers, and what many people find, is that they correlate with market share anyway. So the biggest brands have the best scores on the brand tracker. And that will also come through share of search. So I'm not saying get rid of your brand tracker, but do some correlation analysis, because you may have a cheaper alternative staring you right in the face. Um, obviously, there are some other things that the brand tracker can do that share of search can't. Um, so it's using the right tools for the right kind of outcome. Um, but uh, yeah, for pure, say, brand awareness, I mean, is that that useful if you've got something like this? One of, one of the questions we often get, and I wanted to just get your point of view on it, is that, of course, how does it work for SMEs, right? How does it work for local players? How does it, you know, even 
I talked to somebody in the States as well as, you know, last week. He goes like, can I use this just for the Philadelphia region? And then, of course, there's challenges to that. So what's your experience with SMEs? Uh, with smaller businesses uh, who might not have that many searches, um, what we usually recommend is um, over a period of days. So share of search, uh, search um, takes about 15% of total searches. So there is some variation day to day. Positions should be roughly the same. So what we usually recommend for super small businesses is that they take a sample over four days and then average it. Um, and that rounds it off. Um, over time. Or, and this is why there is a board here, I saw this the other day because I was doing some work for a client, and the share of search, well the, the, the search indices, that's 40, and this is a small lighting SME, um, B2B, and it showed me this. And I was looking at it going, right, okay, that's 40. They're representative of searches in market by someone. And it came to me, right, that's sales engagement. That's literally a salesperson going out and speaking to a potential client and then that potential client searching the next day. And they don't have a marketing function. They aren't using marketing, they're used to using sales. So if we looked at their competitors and we saw that they actually had a continuous We'd go, right, OK, guys, well, the problem is that you're not talking to many people. You're talking to one at a time. Maybe you should use advertising to fill that in and increase your funnel, increase the number of interesting people. So there are ways you can use share of search to analyze your competitors. Obviously, there's the, the, what we call it bootstrapping, which is an average over four days, five days. Or you can derive just simple insights from something like that. Okay, if there's no questions, then I'll ask a question. Um, you touched briefly upon the lagging aspects of various categories. Could you evolve that a bit, looking at uh, how it differs by, by category? Yes, so the, the hypothesis at the moment is that it's related to um, kind of uh, the purchase cycle. So purchase cycle for a car is quite long, um, which is why Les found out that it was nine, nine months, the lag between the initial kind of search and purchase. Um, within cereals, it's two weeks. And most FMCG is two weeks is the highest. But you know what? We're talking the correlation is, is almost identical. That's just the optimal is two weeks. Actually, it's good enough for one week. Because people are searching. People do search for FMCG. I always have this. Oh, it doesn't work. Well, you saw it for makeup. You've seen it for tea. You've seen it for crisps. People do search and they search in proportion to how they buy. So the leading and lagging, we believe, varies according to purchase cycle for category, but we haven't done any more in-depth onto how long that would be. But most companies understand that purchase cycle. So insurance purchase cycle is two weeks after that 52-week reminder. That's how long it takes, because you go and search the market. So I imagine insurance would be almost identical. Um, but because there are only there are a few products out there that have long, distinct per purchase cycles. So yeah, that's what we understand from it. Mats? One thing that comes up every once in a while is, of course, the sentiment about how positive or negative is sort of the, uh, say the, the buzz around the brand. Um, and what's your reflection? I mean, is there really sort of a, a negative effect that is, is sort of noticeable, or is it more, there's nothing more wrong being talked about no matter what they talk about you? Uh, well, there's a great case study in the UK, department stores, there's not many left. John Lewis, one I worked on, um, is probably the only one standing, actually. They're doing their best to fuck that up. Um, but uh, a company called House of Fraser, um, it was going under, it was bought by Mike Ashley, who is a proper market trader, he's a brilliant retailer, but um, there was a lot of negativity around House Fraser as it was going under, and we saw, saw their share of search rocket. Now obviously they weren't growing, <laughs> there's no way they were growing. So we had to factor that out, and when, when that happens, it, it's pretty obvious. So I was working with a company the other week, um, and they were working on schools, and there was a one week 
with a disproportionate number of, uh, of, uh, of, of searches. And I was like, well, what happened then? And unfortunately, there had been an accident and one of the students had been severely hurt. And it had been kind of, um, kind of promoted in the press. And that's what had derived that huge spike. Now, it's easy enough at that point to put a note on your Excel sheet. Uh, and what I usually do, if it's, that's the case, I'll take the average of the previous four weeks and I'll just copy it over. And I'll put a note that will say, was 64 due to accident? It's now there. So you're able to manage those PR, negative PR impacts as well. VW is a great example with the, the kind of uh, the, the issues that they had a few years ago. Um, again, you've just got to be pragmatic about how you use it. Again, I said it's not a perfect measure, um, but yes, that's how I go about doing it anyway. I was a bit intrigued by the part about spending. Uh, yes. So you see correlations of spend and share of search, if I understood you correctly? Yes, yes. And if I don't see that as a brand, is that due to poor <laughs> creatives or uh, undistinct creatives, bad sender ID? Could be, could be in any of the above, and it's worth breaking, actually doing mm. the analysis. If you have got money in market and you are not having an impact on share of search, I'd be worried. I would then look at which channels you're using and what the messaging is, and look at both of them. Um, you can set up tests, A-B tests, et cetera, et cetera. What we usually find um, is that it's, what's most obvious is, is the impact of media. Mm -hmm. So it's the mix that you're going with. And surprise, surprise, what we tend to find is that brands who spend an awful lot on kind of digital direct response and social don't have much of an impact on share of search. Why generalization, I admit. Um, but time and time again, it comes up. There are these businesses out there who are putting all their money into targeted, focused digital campaigns and then wondering why their share of search is falling through the floor, their revenue is falling through the floor. It's because it's not hitting anyone. It's classic kind of Byron Sharp, hit as many people as possible, talk about reach. And you see it through this time and time again. You don't have to rely on Byron. You can see it with share of search. Um, so yes, you, that's, that's one thing that you can do. You can also look at an overlay creative and you can see whether from a time series perspective, remember we've got 15, no, 18 years worth of data. You can put all your creative over time. You can go, right, this is when we launched this widget. This is when we launched that widget. Has it had any impact? Um, and you can see it immediately, especially if you combine it with the zigzag chart, because you can see if it has a, an immediate short-term sales impact because things don't start, suddenly start working in the long term, right? That's magic. That doesn't happen ever. Like, it has to work in the short term for it to work in the long term. Something has to happen in the short term. So you can see that, and that's how you combine it with the indices and the long term share of search to have that dual impact. And it's also proving the 60 40 split is, uh, is sound. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yes, mm. yep, yep. More questions? Or are we. Because I, we have time for one last question. It might be that my Mentimeter isn't working or you're actually not asking any questions. That could also be. So if you've asked questions on the Menti, I can't see them. So please raise your hand then if you wanted to ask something. OK. Then we thank James once more. And he will be available to, for questions uh, after as well if you want to go up to him. So thank you, James. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we're now going to hear from someone who's uh, an expert on the client side working with this in uh, Alexander at Pensionera, who's the CMO at Pensionera, who's been using Sheriff uh, Search in his day-to-day -day work uh, uh, at Pensionera to track his brand performance. So he will dispense some 10 minutes to talk about his uh, lessons and learnings uh, on that. So please welcome Alexander to the stage. So. I hope this is working. Can you hear me correct? Is okay with the sound? I don't think it's working. Is it? You can use this instead if you want. So. Can you hear me better now? Okay. Hello. Nice office you got here, I have to say. Like this one, yeah? And uh, thanks to James as well for a great presentation. So, me, I'm Alexander, and I work as a CMO for a smaller company in the pension savings and pensions insurance. So this is a bit of a, um, I would say, a tough category 
to get uh, some data off. Um, I've been working in marketing for, yeah, well, I stopped counting after 10 years, so I don't think that's relevant at the moment. I'm schooled in behavioral science, so for me it's important to know that people usually don't give too much about brands. They probably more or want to know if they are like available for you at the moment when you need it and so on. So I'm one of them that also read a bit of marketing. So when I was done with my marketing courses, I had to reschool myself like a couple of years later because of Byron Sharp. So thank you, because I was schooled in Kotler. Um, so I've been interested in shared search for a couple of years. I actually saw James and Les presentation 2020. Uh, and that's when I got interested. So I've been doing all this Excel work and stuff like that that James is talking about. And uh, I mean, I'm sorry for my <laughs> swearing, but it took shitloads of time, to be fair. So when I was a consultant, <laughs> uh, I was like, okay, I need to speed this up because uh, otherwise I, I can't, do, can't do this with 10, 15 clients. It was heavy work. Um, and of course, client didn't want to pay, pay that much money for it. So um, for me, I started using my telescope, so I could just say LinkedIn can do magic sometimes, connection-wise. So at this moment now, I'm a CMO, um, so I took the leap from being an, into an agency, a marketing consultant, and uh, I have been working in a different kind of C-level groups. There's also been, always been the same challenge for every C-level group I've been working with. Um, and there's like, we can all agree that metrics are important, you know? And uh, many people talk about the CAC and the ROAS and all these short-term things, right? But there's never been like a proper metric to show fat, quick and easy for the brand metrics or the long-term. And uh, for, me, for me, the most important person in my C-level team is the CFO. So when I s share my data with him, around share of search and I can say that, okay, I can see that we probably have a growth coming in, in the previous month, then he's very, very interested to hear more about it. So w that's also one of the challenges like James talked about earlier, is like the lag, if we are lagging or not, or are we leading? Uh, for me, it has been quite hard to actually calculate that for my category at the moment. So maybe we have something to talk about later, James. <laughs> um, Usually, uh, my experience with the C-level teams are that there is um, there's a l lack of uh, knowledge about long-term brand building and how that affects sales. So I, I learned a new word today, which is the zigzag curve. I never heard that expression before, but I liked it. So for me, that's, that's something that I need to like educate C-level teams in, okay? So usually they, they present a traditional survey from like a brand tracking survey or something and they look at all this granular data, which is awesome to have, right? But then they pay too much money for it usually. So we at Pensionea, what we did was we using the brand trackers as well, but only for the granular data to get like the bigger picture to see if we're on track with our adopted strategies or if we are growing with, with the category or not, or if we are, for example, um, if our spend, media spend does what it should be doing, that we now use share of search for because it's cheaper and easier to use. And I can just show like one graph and that's it for all my uh, C-level meetings, which is excellent. It's, most of the people like that, so. Um, so um, that's like the most quick and interesting information we have, but that's the challenges at the moment for me is to find the lag. That's the biggest challenge for me at the moment. And the biggest upside I would say is the, well, to know if we have the, the growing in mental availability or not, because that will tell us that we are connected to more SEPs in the category, which is, very, very interesting for me to know. And with that, we can also work with our SEO a bit different, for example, to do the keyword analysis in another way. Um, so the, 
the, um, the mix between the SEO, uh, SOS and the, the sentiment data is also interesting because, as you know, for pensions in Sweden, there has been a lot of cases where uh, there has been uh, cheating. Uh, Alra, for example, you have Falcon funds and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of negative uh, information out there. And when you are a small business in this category, there, there is a lot of searches, for example, if this is a fake business or, for example, why do we need Banki Day and all these things. So for me, it's also been a nice showing that a lot of our interest in our brand is not because they're interested in our service. They are interested in to know if we are a fraud or not. So this is also something interested for the C-level team to know because they didn't know before. They had no clue before. So in my experience is that share of search is not the perfect metric, but it shows enough for me to actually be able to talk to different stakeholders uh, in a different way and show usually just one or two graphs and they usually get it the first time, what it is. So, um, yeah, that's, that's basically the, to, to sum up my experience. Um, is that any questions or something? No? Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I know you're using our tool, but I, I just want one question that I have is, um, do you use as well um, for, let's say, strategic work when it comes to kind of either your brand positioning or, or I mean, you said that you use it in collaboration or in conjunction with more deeper brand surveys and whatever, but do you then see, okay, compared to what other, what other competitors there are, where we place ourselves and, and how would we do that? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, so what we do, uh, I do still do some of the Excel work. And that's because uh, what we have seen is like the biggest competitors to us is the big banks. And since they have a lot of more products and services than we have, they also have a higher interest in, in those brands. So we, we, we used it actually, uh, I'm using it at the moment to build our strategy for 2023. So uh, I'm using it, but I'm not done with it yet. So I can't say that the experience is good or bad, but I'm saying that so far it's good. I would have to say. So we're using it in a long-term strategic sense as well. But that's also an education part because I have to learn my colleagues in the C-level team to, to actually know what we're looking at and how we're going to look at it. So, so yeah, I'm using it at the moment in that way. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yes? How do you separate your, um, your product in relation to the big bang? So basically what we do is not, at the moment we're not separating at all. Because if, for example, uh, Lance Fisakinger is one of the, I mean they have like quite a big market share when it comes to pensions, okay? So I know that if we're gonna, we're gonna steal or borrow market shares, we're gonna end up with as much new customers from Lance Fisakinger as they have market share, right? So we're only looking at them in a big way at this moment because that kind of deep data we're not doing at this moment. Uh, we don't have the resources for that. So we're just looking at them at, as a competitor in, in a whole because we are also adding uh, new products as well. So we're going to compete with them as well. But it's a great question and no, we're not doing that at, at this moment. We're doing more like uh, keyword analysis and stuff like that in, in that sense. in share of search. Yeah. Do you ask me or do you ask my boss? <laughs> I know this is a recording, so I don't know if I want to answer that. Yeah, on the, the separating. Yeah. Um, so if, if you recall back to the beginning, we talked about share of search representative of revenue, essentially. So what you can do to separate is if you understand the proportion that that product delivers to total revenue, you can apply a factor to the search index. So let's say life insurance is 20% of that bank. Right, okay. Well, you've got a figure for the index of, of that bank. 
you apply 20% to it. And it works, because that's what share research is. It's a, a representative of revenue, and all you're doing is comparing it like for like with other, other brands and businesses. And I've done that multiple times. It's harder to get that data. It means going through loads of financial papers and relying on that business to say, I derive 20% from pensions, but you can do it that way. Um, and in fact, the iPEDS data, um, so the US distance learning one, was almost perfectly correlated. That had been factored because some universities don't just have distance learning, they have campus. And so all I did was factor the proportion of students that went distance learning to their numbers and lo, it all came into a line. So there's a way of doing it, but it's a bit more manual than you probably want to want. So I have more work to do. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Work with their agency in regards to search. Ooh. Should I? I've been in an agency for nine years before I ended up as a CMO. Um, I believe that uh, this is just me. Okay, so this. Okay, so I believe that if if you have the resources and the time in your own company to do this, you should absolutely have someone to can look at it. But I think also that there is, um, uh, you might also have an uh, advantage to work with an agency that actually can see different categories and how they pay off in share of search as well. So I think that the collaboration there is the best one, I think, to be fair. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander.